Under the command of Genghis Khan, the Mongol hordes were once the undisputed masters of warfare on the Asian mainland. But what if their merciless rampage was met with hard discipline and the willpower of Japan's elite samurai warriors? It's katanas versus battle axes, lances versus spears, and honor versus ambition. Before we introduce the armaments and tactics that would lead one side to victory, it's worth noting that such a clash very nearly took place in the 13th century. At the time, the Mongol Empire spanned across most of Eurasia, from modern-day Hungary all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Kublai Khan, the grandson of Genghis, wanted to expand his family's empire even further, and so began the arduous process of adapting to naval combat. The Mongols attempted to invade Japan a total of three times, and two out of the three were thwarted by massive typhoons that sank thousands of ships and devastated the invading fleets. This incident was later referred to as the Kamikaze, or Divine Wind, by the Japanese, as it was such a miraculous natural occurrence that it could only be attributed to the intervention of gods. The term became more recognized globally when it was reused to describe the dive bomb maneuvers used by Japanese pilots during World War II. But if Japan's gods were not so protective and these divine winds never came, a powerful enemy would have reached their shores and a battle beyond history would have taken place. To even the odds, we'll imagine that both sides have the optimal weapons and strategies to employ against the other. With all that said, let's see who wins out and who takes the crown of Asia's best 13th century warriors. Now let's talk about the bow and arrow. Since the Mongols preferred to face their enemies on horseback, archery was a core tenant of their combat style. The Mongol composite bow was designed to be drawn by users with greater arm strength than any other contemporary bows and boasted a considerable increase in range as a result. Their trade secret was that the curved part of the bow wasn't made from just a single material. Rather, they layered multiple types of material to create the curve. This increased the bow's durability and gave the arrows a higher chance of armor penetration. Composite bows were typically built from wood, bamboo, or the horns of animals all materials that the Mongols could find in abundance in their steppe homeland. One of the winning strategies employed by Mongol light cavalry, which was even used to great effect in the few land battles between the Mongols and the Japanese, was unleashing hundreds of arrows during a charge. These arrows were sometimes tipped with poison in order to make long-term engagements even more painful for the opposing army. Botanical poisons were the most common, but sometimes snake venom was also extracted for this purpose. Snake handling was another skill that the Mongols picked up from their nomadic ancestors, and with access to many species of snakes, they had more than their pick of venom. The mounted archers also used whistling arrows, which were outfitted with hollow bone accessories that worked exactly like a modern whistle. As these arrows flew toward their target, the wind passing through the hollow bone would create a bone-chilling noise, scaring the enemy and reducing their morale. While less overtly deadly than armor-piercing and poisoned arrows, whistling arrows could also be used to startle horses unfamiliar with the noise and draw attention to key locations across the battlefield. This was tied to the Mongol horde's ability to convey orders without the use of language, as signals were derived to units through the coded beating of war drums. Contrary to the image of on-foot swordsmen that might come to mind when you hear the word samurai, the original warriors who held the title were also trained in mounted archery. Samurai bows were called yumi, and were often taller than the archer who wielded them. They were usually made of bamboo and required careful maintenance to avoid the material losing its signature asymmetrical curve. A yumi could be passed down through several generations if they received the proper maintenance. Before the katana sword became the universal symbol of the samurai, the yumi bow, or more directly, the techniques of kyojutsu, the art of archery, was what set the noble samurai apart from ordinary soldiers. One of the oldest forms of bushido, the samurai code, was the way of the bow and horse, an ethical approach to warfare that's been compared to the European concept of chivalry. Like many cultures throughout the ancient world, the Japanese took a sporting approach to warfare, and many training exercises for mounted archers were turned into popular games for the nobility. For example, the practice of inoumono, or dog shooting, saw mounted archers firing arrows at running dogs in an enclosed range. The sport has a checkered history and was briefly banned in the 12th century before being revived by the wealthy Ogasawara clan, with its members writing extensively about Inoomono's importance to the cultivation of strong samurai. Incidentally, while the practice was long since outlawed, the 18th president of the United States, Ulysses S. Grant, was treated to a reenacted version of Inoomono while visiting Japan, which the dog-loving former general reportedly found entirely distasteful. Aside from the mounted variation, 
Standing archery was also practiced widely in Japan as the samurai class rose to prominence. Several schools were founded with the sole focus of honing archers' skills to the highest degree, with the Heiki school style proving to be the most lethal when it came to battlefield practicality. The fundamental practice of archery came to be so intertwined with the Japanese culture that when the era of firearms arrived, the old ways of the longbow were elevated to a method of spiritual training for warriors and athletes alike. Most battles that took place in 13th century Japan would have begun with both sides letting loose volleys of arrows before charging in to engage in melee combat. However, when pitted against a fighting force as large and as terror-inducing as the Mongol horde, committing to the gentlemanly fighting ways of the Bushido Code could be a grave mismatch. One such example was the fate of one samurai lieutenant fighting under Sosuke Kune, who upon defeating an imposing Mongol in one-on-one -on -one combat stood atop his fallen opponent and called for another challenger and was peppered by a hail of arrows from offshore Mongol ships. While the Mongols were known for overwhelming their enemies with maneuverability and sheer numbers, their leaders were also infamous for using attacks with stealth and implementing sabotage tactics to a great extent. As Sun Tzu famously wrote in The Art of War, every battle is won before it's ever fought. The Mongols adhered to this principle and implemented it to a T, distinguishing themselves through well-executed plans that would leave the enemy confused and shaken. Drum beats may have been used to communicate with troops once a battle began, but Mongol war doctrine dictated that there should be no musical cue preceding the first wave of a Mongol assault to preserve the element of surprise. Though archery would likely play a role at the start of any Mongol samurai skirmish, a transition into melee combat would be inevitable, either through the samurai aiming to neutralize their foe's mobility or through the Mongols running out of arrows in their relentless pursuit. This brings us to the question of which army carries the more dangerous arms for close combat. Mongol soldiers were armed with a vast array of edged weapons, from battle axes to daggers. Their usage was offset by mid-range weapons such as hooked spears and lassos, which were a lot more useful when on horseback. Both were used to snare an opposing horseman and force them from their mount to the ground. Once an enemy combatant was dismounted, allied riders could move in and eliminate them with daggers or by having an armored warhorse trample over them. While the weapons themselves were formidable and in the early days of Genghis Khan were likely made from some of the only metal the Mongols were able to get their hands on, it was not the craftsmanship that made them exceptional fighters. Much like the composite bow that was mentioned earlier, the physical prowess of each individual Mongol warrior was what made them fearsome opponents in melee. Traditionally, the Mongols raised children of both sexes to be able to hunt and wrestle so that they'd be able to handle the strenuous tasks that a military campaign demanded. These rites of passage, once born from a need for survival, created a meritocratic structure for capable men and women to improve into fearsome fighters. Of course, big muscles are only as good as the food that nourishes them, and as nomads, the Mongols had to learn to have their food on the move with them. Rations of lamb meat and cheese kept the members of the horde full and hardy on long marches, while additional beasts of burden like camels and mules bore the weight of other supplies, allowing the Mongols to conserve energy for when it was most needed. This learned mastery over the terrain of continental Asia served the Mongols well in domestic warfare, but it would prove to be a double-edged sword in any conflict that took them overseas, such as a proper invasion of Japan. Once their initial food supplies ran out, the Mongols would need to have time to adapt to the flora and fauna of the Japanese homeland, and during this time, the counterattacks from samurai forces would lead to a disproportionate amount of casualties. Even in the smaller scale invasions that took place in the 13th century, the samurai took advantage of their own knowledge of the local environment to fortify against the invaders. When a relatively small island nation is being attacked by a much larger empire from the mainland, Every bit of technical wisdom the native population can muster becomes another arrow in the metaphorical quiver. Since well before the Mongol horde set their sights on Japan from across the waters, the samurai were accustomed to finding advantages in unlikely places, such as in their ingenious use of satetsu, a type of sand that's dense with heavy concentrations of iron. For centuries, Japanese smiths forged the satetsu into metal and hammered it into the shape of a sword, folding it over ten times on average. Through this arduous process of primal metallurgy, the soul of the samurai was brought into being. The katana was born. Deceptively heavy for its compact size, the katana was ideal for slashing through flesh and bone. In the hands of a trained samurai, it would shred through multiple lightly armored adversaries with incredible ease. This would not bode well for the typical Mongol cavalry rider 
whose armor was usually made of leather or hide to keep them light and agile while mounted on horseback. Heavier armor and shields would prove more of a challenge for the blade, and it's rumored that future generations of katanas owe their increased cutting power to modifications made in response to the durability of Mongol heavy cavalry armor. But as vicious as the katana is, there exists a Japanese sword that mounted warriors should fear even more, a kind of sword so legendary that it may as well be a myth. The Japanese Zanbato, or horse slaying sword, is a theoretical cavalry blade descended from the Chinese Zanmadao. As the English name implies, these enormous swords were brought to the battlefield for a single purpose, to cleave through both horse and rider in a single horrifying swing. Some tales of the Zanbato attest that it was meant to target the legs of a steed, tearing through barding as it rendered the unfortunate quadruped completely unable to move. While the name Zanbato is only a Japanese language reading of Zanmadao and thus isn't used in historical record outside of directly referring to the Chinese variation, the giant blade staggering feats of anti-cavalry warfare were very much real. They were, however, not attributed to any weapon until the 14th century, when the colossal Odachi, a larger variant of the katana, came into use. Even so, if the Japanese possessed any blade similar to the Zanmadao during the 13th century, then most certainly they would have used them against the Mongols as the horde moved inland. When comparing armor, the Oyoroi was the pinnacle of 13th century Japanese armor, but was subject to the same limitations as other heavy armor. Most importantly, the lack of mobility and difficulty wielding weapons with finesse. This meant that the katana was not the weapon of choice for the most heavily armored samurai, who would either remain mounted for as long as possible or utilize spears to strike at enemies from a distance. The Oyoroi was also rather expensive and reserved for only the highest ranked warriors, meaning that most of the Japanese army would have to do without it. The Mongol horde meanwhile had far more resources to construct armor from due to the expansiveness of their territory. Though chainmail armor was not as prevalent across the empire as it was in Europe, the Mongols had enough iron that it could be woven into their leather armor to strengthen it against blows from slashing weapons. Overall, it was still a major risk for any samurai on the ground to strike at a charging Mongol cavalry rider, and a poorly timed swing could cause the attacker's sword to be caught in the folds of the enemy's armor. We should also mention that given the overwhelming numerical advantage the Mongols had, even the finest sword would get worn down in a battle of attrition. In order to beat the Mongols in a prolonged war, the Japanese would have to abandon all previous notions of sportsmanship in their tactics. We saw this during the second invasion of Japan, during which the samurai struck at night without warning and used spears to puncture the hulls of enemy ships. In addition, having learned how ill-advised it was to face the horde on land, the samurai deployed multiple boats into the shallow waters of the coast to blockade the enemy and keep them from letting troops out into the shore. Even without the typhoons to bring about a miraculous victory, the samurai were likely to be anything but a pushover for the largest empire on the planet. As the invasion progressed, they proved to be adaptable and quick learners, allowing them to develop tactics needed in order to seize victory from the jaws of defeat. It was only after the samurai began to play by the Mongol rules of engagement that the war began to turn in their favor. With an embrace of cold pragmatism and the superior tactics of the invading force, the samurai could have negated the numbers advantage and may very well have won our hypothetical battle. But would those warriors who claimed victory even be considered true samurai anymore? Now check out horrifying things Genghis Khan did to his enemies to see what the Mongols would have done to the samurai if they won. Or watch Genghis Khan, Greatest Conqueror Ever?